Tēnā tātou katoa. Nō mai, haere mai, and welcome to this webinar titled Representation, Power and Mass Communication. This session had a slightly different title when the programme came out some months ago, but we have since tweaked it for clarity. The kaupapa is exactly the same. My name is Dr Atakohu Middleton, and I'm a journalist and senior lecturer in the School of Communication Studies at Auckland University of Technology. Now, some housekeeping before we get underway. Um, there are some rules for interacting, as you can see on the screen. Now, as the discussion unfolds in the next hour, you're welcome to send questions through, make comments and share links, and we will address them later in the session. Now, I would at this stage like to thank two people whom you can't see, but whom are very important, who are very important to this enterprise, moderator Jared Nicholl and our tech support Charles Rolleston for keeping the technical side moving today. An online webinar of this scale is a major feat. We have had precisely 1,122 registrations for this webinar. Now, as there are some challenging issues up for discussion, We'll now do a karakia to centre us all and focus us on the topic of the hour. Tikina tikina tūra te pū take o ngā kōrero o te wānanga. Tikina tūra te hau tapu ngā reki, kau whate te e tāne te wānanga ki runga ki a mātou katoa. Ki a koe te matapunenga ki a maingi te pū i hui ho ka whakamau ai ki a tīna. Haumi e, hui e, so let's refresh our memories. Um, as I said, the abstract for the session has been slightly reworded for clarity since the program came out a few months ago. Representation, racism, power and mass communication. Now, media can carry social power and influence for owners and leaders and may reflect and favour their worldviews over others if internal and external checks and balances are lacking. Unchecked media can cause harm to others by excluding the authentic voices of communities, stigmatising and marginalising people, surfacing prejudice, creating negative stereotypes and perpetuating racism. The internet has amplified the issues around representation and power in mass communication, with users being able to access all forms of digital communication. Algorithms delivering what readers have preferred to view in the past can play a role in amplifying misinformation and disinformation, increasing prejudice, and creating conditions that increase inequality. So what does it all mean? How do people keep themselves informed but safe too? What responsibility do media companies have to acknowledge and counter the prejudices that may lie within? What are some of the solutions? I'm delighted now to introduce you to two people with a wealth of knowledge on these issues. Carmen Padahi is a senior editor at Stuff, and was the driving force behind the media company's historic 2020 apology for its many decades of misrepresentation of Māori. Carmen runs Stuff's Po Tiaki section, which focuses on stories from and about underserved communities. Last year, Carmen was named Editorial Executive of the Year in the Voyager Media Awards. Carmen is from Ngāti Kahangunu, Ngāti Hine and Rongu Whakata. Tēnā koe, Carmen. Tēnā koe. Dr. Rawi Taonui is an independent writer, researcher and advisor on Māori, Indigenous and intercultural human rights, equity, diversity and anti-racism. He was Aotearoa's first Professor of Indigenous Studies and, during the COVID pandemic, has undertaken extensive quantitative analysis of its impact on Māori. Rawi is on the Human Rights Commission's National Anti-Racism Task Force. Rawari is, is of Te Hiki, uh, Hikutu and Ngāti Korokoro, Te Kaputai and Ngāti Paiahi, Ngāti Rora, Ngāti Whēru and Ngāti Te Taonui. Tēnā koe Rawari. Now to start, I'm going to ask each of our speakers to speak to the abstract and then we'll see where the hour takes us. Carmen, I'd like to start our corridor today by turning to you. This kaupapa, representation in mass media, is something that you've catalogued over many years. In your mind, what responsibility do media companies have to acknowledge and counter the prejudices that may lie within? I um e tu ana fa kai tina i raro i i arangi nui i tonga i a papa tu ana ku e titi roki nga puke fa kahi nga wai a rohi rohi me nga tini uri o tani mahuta nga toka tu moana kei a tu nui kei a kurahi e te tii te ta te na koutou katoa. 
Mai mai rā e te rangatiri i te rā wiki tā Wira Gardena me tōku whaia Marina Ropihan ni Shasha o ki oki ki ngā matua tipuna. Ko kai whakahaere o te hui nei ko Iridani Baikaro ko Heather Kame he mahi nui tēnei ki a kōrua. E hoa, ko ato kohu me rā uri ki a kaha, ki a maia, ki a mano nui. Ko ngā tika hanunu, ngā tihene me rongo whakata o kuiwi Ko Carmen Parahia Hau. Um, so, yes, I am the Poutiaki editor uh, and uh, actually of recent uh, Poutiaki Matua at Stuff. Uh, Poutiaki, uh, contrary to uh, public discussion in the last few days, Poutiaki uh, is Kopapa Māori. Uh, it was uh, instigated a, few year, a couple of years ago. So it is a kaupapa, it is a strategy within stuff to, uh, to focus on fair representation of te ao Māori. At the same time, as we uplift the voices, uh, stories uh, of Māori uh, and behaviours journalists for Māori uh, to represent them fairly, uh, Māori fairly, uh, at the same time, we also have to uh, uh, increase the equity for other underserved communities. So that is what Potiaki it is, is. It is more than just a section on the Stuff website. It is more than just doing a story here and there and a voice here and there. It is about a, a commitment uh, to do better because we know we've failed in the past. Um, a couple of years ago, uh, we started the Potiaki uh, journey to, uh, and it started with a group of journalists at Stuff who uh, disliked the way we were continually representing Māori and other communities, particularly Māori. Uh, and so we gathered together as a uh, whānau pōtiaki to, um, to work, uh, approach our leaders uh, for better representation of Te Māori. And uh, from that point uh, came a set of actions Part of those actions was a uh, tamato pono, our truth, which was to investigate stuff to find out what we'd done and how we'd represented Māori uh, in our papers. So our papers are uh, 160 years old. Uh, and so we went uh, that far back to uh, look at what we'd done. Uh, and in the project tamato pono, we discovered that we had uh, marginalised Māori, that we had created, helped create stereotypes that we had been racist in the way we'd reported on Māori uh, and that we hadn't fairly represented Māori um, over the years, through the decades. There were some really good points, of course, but generally um, we hadn't. And so um, after we'd investigated ourselves, um, we then uh, asked ourselves if we had to apologise for all we'd done. Um, and so we did. Um, and it's been, and it's hard work, right? So we're trying to turn around 160 years of prejudice within a, a media organisation and within papers. Uh, journalism is a British construct. It came with... Uh, it came with the first settlers uh, from uh, Britain. And um, those papers really did, uh, were set up to support the views, political views, uh, economic uh, positioning of um, settlers from Europe. And because of that, that is its history. That is the history of journalism in this country. Um, and so uh, that's what we've had to work with. And uh, it's it's hard these last couple of years because everyone wants the change to happen now. And when I think about Te Tiriti 182 years, it's taken us to get to this point. We're still having this discussion around Te Tiriti and trying to get it into everything that we do in Aotearoa to uh, talk about anti-racism. It's 182 years since the treaty and we still haven't got to where we need to be. So... I'm a very impatient person and I've always just thought that I would have solved, that we would have solved the problems of um, and the issues within journalism, within media organisations in two years. 
that's quite ridiculous of me to even think that. So what I realize is I can only do the work I can do now um, and can only then pass it on to others to take up the challenge as well. So it is really just understanding that uh, we only just build on the work of everybody else. So um, I only build on the work of people like Wena Harawira, Tini Molyneux, Derek Fox, Fai Nata before them. Um, it was our real Māori, our um, uh, Ngā Tamatoa. Before them, it was our great leaders who came into politics, um, our Te Oti old boys. And before them, it was all our uh, ancestors, right, that were part of the signing of the treaty. So all this work to get us to this point, we've got a long way to go. But at least finally, we're uh, having honest conversations within stuff, challenging conversations, full physical stand up sometimes. Um, but that has been my experience as a journalist since uh, I started in 2001 uh, in newsrooms uh, that uh, this is that we've had to do this. Um, but luckily, I worked in uh, Māori media at um, TVNZ and at Māori television. And in those cultural safe places, I was able to, uh, you know, really um, keep myself safe and continue in this industry because it's a hard slog for Māori journalists to be in it. But, you know, we love journalism. There is a, it's a brilliant profession. There is a role for the news media to play as the fourth estate to hold power to account. The problem that we've done is that we haven't held power to account on behalf of Māori, on behalf of all underserved communities. And so now we've got to turn this around. We're asking for better journalism. We're asking for better organisations to understand, yes, more te reo Māori, yes, more Māori voices, uh, but also to understand our role uh, in a tetiriti framework and also to uh, understand how we must stick up, for, how we must also ask hard questions of power and authority for Māori. For example, if we hadn't have done this work, uh, I know that we wouldn't have been asking uh, what's happening for Māori when it comes to the pandemic. I know that if we hadn't apologised and if we hadn't made all journalists aware that you must ask questions for Māori as you do for the general populations. You must ask specific questions for, every, for, for our community. So I know if we hadn't have done that in the pandemic time, we would have really struggled to really lift the voices of Māori. So being able to um, work with, so I mean, I have, to, I really have to acknowledge the work that Rawari is doing. I mean, Rawari Tauni has been his own one research bandwagon who's been relentless and so good and providing a solid evidence-based voice um, for the issues facing Māori communities. So without us doing that work and ensuring and, 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 and elevating the voices of Māori, I think we would have struggled through this pandemic to get those voices really shown and, and really, really push the politicians to really back their stuff up, right? When it, our, um, and I just wanted to, you know, send out a massive me to all our um, all our Māori health experts, our nurses, doctors, all of our hauora workers who are out in the communities doing all the work they've been doing because they really, they're the ones that have just shown us that it's possible. My, by Māori, for Māori, we have the solutions within our community. So um, there's some really hard stuff going on in the media. It's going to take time and there are a lot of people that are impatient that want us to just solve all the solutions, get rid of all the racism, to really create equ equity uh, in the media, but we're just, we're not there yet. It's just step by step by step. And sometimes I get very aggrieved and I, and I just want to give up sometimes, to be honest. Um, but what keeps me going is, um, is remembering that I'm there building on the back of, of other people um, but also uh, people like um, uh, one of my uh, ancestors, um, uh, Sir James Hinari, and it's one of it's his fucking pokey that keeps me going actually. To just remember that, despite the criticisms that come from 
uh, within uh, within stuff, within the media, within Maoriism, because I get because we get criticised all the time. Uh, despite all of that, what he has said keeps me on track, and so. Ko tafetike to haere nga mai kia kore e haere tonu. E tonu nui rawa o mahi kia kore e mahi tonu. You have come too far not to go further. You have done too much not to do more. So that's the only thing really that keeps me that and knowing that this uh, Pautiaki is Kopapa Māori. It was started by Māori. Uh, it had a very, it's got a uh, Kopapa Foundation, it's got a treaty base because it's in our um, company charter now we are just working through what that looks like how do we action this these are the so i've come here um hoping to engage with everyone to with a uh, in a state of curiosity and hope that um, i can also get ideas from people but also um, just to acknowledge a lot of the great work that everyone else is doing, even you and yourself, Atakohu, with all the work you've doing, been doing around Māori media and what that means, more of our people need to see your kōrero e hoa so that they can understand that we, you know, Māori media, uh, the me media is there. It has a very strong role, and I believe in the high ideals of journalism. Um, but I also believe we can do better when it comes to representation. So um, there's much for us to talk about today, and I better shut up because I'm taking over Rawadi's time. He <laughs> always has a lot to say, Rawadi, so I'll just hand over the baton to Ewa. Rawe Carmen, Rawe Ewa. Rawadi, to you now. So when you ponder the issue of representation, racism, power, and mass communication, what springs to mind? And there's always one that never turns on his microphone. <laughs> oh, I was just practicing. Um, Tutahi, Emi Kawaki Anna Kia Koto, Tsurupu, Mana Fakahari, Fakatu Anna Tine Wananga, to Kopapa, Fakarai, Fakakuri, to Kaikiri Tangi, Roto Itao, to Panui Tanga, Tina Atu, Mihi Atu, Kikoku, Tuahine, Carmen, to Honore, Kite. No tahi, ki faka fiti fiti kororo, faka mana iti nei kau papa. Hoi ano e te whanui, aho ko ano fia mai te toka taku i tai noa ki te pungo o te waka, te tēnā koutou, e mihi atu ki a koutou i dāro i te kora wai o rangi nui, rangi rua, tā whiri rangi, te hau faka ora tau e pāngi ngā kiri tangata. Tēnā atu, ka whakamihi a koutou i rungu i te whārihi o te papa tua noku i te papa tua rangi i te papa awhi, awhi ana i a tātou o ngā whakatuku ranga. Tēnā ka mihi, ko mihi a atu ki a koutou i rohu i roto i te reo o etahi o ngā tūpuna, e hi ana au ki ka whakamihi a koutou i roto i etahi atu o ngā reo nunui o te motu nei. Hoi anō. Namaste, namaskar, meri dost, apo spaga hei meri dost to. Talo falawe, le lei lava ona vahai atu i autau uma, awhia mai matala mai ao i lenei aso, manai te lei lenei aso e potopoto mā whaatasi le tātou ainga. Ni hao mā, Wang Shang Hao, wen hau, Wang Shang Hao, wai te ao sits o whang zu, uh, Assalamu alaikum, mahaba bikum, shumiyam, uh, shukram laika, uh, hoi anō, uh, nā haku nō e mihi atu, e mihi, mihi atu anō ki a tātou, uh, tēnā tātou ki tātou. Uh, so uh, I'm on uh, Rawari, uh, just a, a bit about my background, I've been writing columns for the media I think for about 24 years um, now. Um, along the way I, I, I won three um, Media awards. My, my primary experience with uh, uh, media racism re really came at a personal level. So, so uh, at one time I had a, re a weekly column for a particular newspaper, and there was a change of editor, and the new editor didn't like my stuff. So I got a message that my column would be terminated, and I had a month's notice. So I left pretty much straight away. But it, but it just so happened that. Um, uh, Juno from that newspaper quite liked my columns and, and suggested I pop them into the media awards. So I, I wrapped up three or four columns. I think that's what you did in the day and I popped those in. 
And then the media awards were on a Friday night at the casino in Auckland. And um, my wife's a really keen Warriors supporter and they were playing a big game on the Friday night. So I had to sort of choose between the rugby league or the awards. And since I was just starting out and I was only like two years into my first lectureship, I thought, well, you know, that's not really going to work out. So I went to the rugby league instead. Um, and then the following morning, I, I obtained a copy of said newspaper I'd formerly been writing for and, and looked up the winners for the media awards. And there was this nice piece, you know, we had 13 winners and there was a list of names. And I wasn't on the list of names. So I thought, hey, good choice. I went to the, the watch the Warriors have, win, have a great win on Friday night. The following Tuesday, I received um, uh, my award in the post. And, and I'd won uh, the section in those days, uh, a best columnist on the human condition. And I ended up as joint runner up to Paul Holmes as columnist of the year, which was pretty amazing. So I went back to the original article and where it said 13 winners, and then I counted the names, and there were 13 winners, but only 12 names. And I realized that um, my name wasn't included because they'd only just fired me. Um, my other experience in the early days of, of, of writing columns was I'd get a steady stream of, of hate mail, mainly the, uh, through written, written mail. And I used to, my main strategy for dealing with that was actually just to throw them in a box. And when I was in a good mood, I'd pull them out and read them. And some of them are quite humorous. You know, like one guy used to write to me anonymously on a regular basis. And he'd have my column in his letter. And it was, it was really funny because he used to screw it up and then flatten it out and fold it. And it would have these big red marks on it. And uh, in about 2009, I had a phone call from my vice chancellor at Canterbury asking if if I would, uh, you know, they'd received a complaint. And I said, oh, what's that about? And he said, oh, you wrote a column saying uh, Māori First World War veterans uh, didn't get the same uh, support when they came back from the war as, as Pākehā War veterans. And I said, yes, that's correct. I did write that column, and, and that is an historical fact. And, and uh, the Vice-Chancellor's office said to me, well, we're going to write them a letter about academic freedom and things like that, and, and just wondered if you would do the same. And I said, well, uh, no, I'm not going to be able to do that. And, and um, you know, I said, oh, uh, why is that? He was, he was a bit taken aback. He was a big surprise. And, and I said, well, the thing is, is I get a regular stream of, of hate mail. And um, if I was to start writing back to everyone, then you'd be paying me to write letters to racists. And it would be quite time consuming. And, and um, so the person was speaking with said, oh, is that for real? I said, oh, well, I've got a box here. I said, and I put my hand in the box and pulled one out. And, and I said, oh, here's one. It says, F you, you black sea. And then here's another one. Um, your ancestors were all cannibals, which is actually quite true. I'm named after a cannibal. And, um, you know, he's tall, handsome, good looking cannibal. And, um, you know, and so on and so on like that. So I said, you know, respectfully, I have to decline. Now, um, with, the, with the sort of uh, developments that have come along in terms of stuff and the wider recruitment of Māori journalists um, into the media generally, you know, it's a new uh, Hurihanga Nui at TV1, uh, Tarina Kōwhai at News Hub, um, uh, Maxine Jacobs at Stuff, and a whole range of others. Um, we're now sharing the racism, so I get a bit less of it. And, and, you know, I just really like to thank Carmen for her efforts in that regard. Um, I still am uh, a recipient of that stuff, particularly during COVID, there's been a pickup. Um, I, uh, I made, I made uh, number 13 on the um, crimes against, COVID crimes against humanity hit list, where we're going to be arrested um, and put on trial and some of us hung. Um, I, I was I was trying to break into the top ten, um, but I, I the next time I saw the list, I'd actually been demoted to twenty. Um, but at least I was off the dreaded thirteen, I guess. Um, <clears throat> but we've we've had to sort of put in a bit of security in that. We have had one visit at home um, from 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 someone where we had to deal with just before. Um, um, Christmas, so they're all those kind of general things to monitor at, at a personal level. Uh, but as I said, that's it's wonderful to have that shared more generally amongst Māori journals around around the Motu. I don't feel so lonely. 
Um, but those are all, all a sort of um, issues that just come uh, with part of, you know, being part of someone who participates in the media from a um, Māori point of view. Um, I went on later to, to win two other uh, media awards, and but I, I was made aware in 2008 and 2009 that because I wasn't a professional journalist, um, that there were, were moves to dismantle uh, what they used to have in those days were uh, Pacific columnist of the year and the Māori columnist of the year because the last two awards I, I won were in the Māori category. Um, and uh, I, was, I was at an award ceremony in Wellington and, and it was made known to me that people were very happy with that. And that's one of the things they were looking at. And ultimately those, those awards were dis, uh, disestablished, I think, at about 210. Um, but, you know, uh, with the regular races flattery I get, I, I still realise I'm doing a good job, so I'm not too bothered either way. Um, most re my most recent one is I had an email from someone saying um, I was, you know, I'm a retired lab technician, and with respect to COVID, you're not a real doctor. Um, you're an arts doctor and so on and so forth. And I just wrote back a short reply and said, well, you know, it's interesting that no one, no one says that about Michael Plank. Um, Sean Hendry, you know, one's a physicist, one's a mathematician, and, but you are correct. Um, I'm not a medical doctor and I can't diagnose the rash um, now proliferating across the back of your neck, but I, I can diagnose and recommend treatment for racism. So I recommend that you isolate at home, take two doses, two 30 minute doses of te reo Māori uh, each day and undertake a rapid anti-racism test and not, not leave home until such time as you test negative. Thank you. Boy, or not, I'm happy to um, engage with the questions that, and offer what I can, uh, where I can. It's, really, it's a real uh, honour to, to be here and discuss these sorts of issues, which are really, really important for our society as we move forward, uh, both in terms of te ao Māori, but also in terms of our greater uh, diversity. I think that um, I think that stuff will uh, take up that checklist of yours, Rawari, and maybe make that public, publish that on our stuff uh, website as well. I think that's a really excellent antidote for racism. Yeah. Yep, through this pandemic time. No, love your um, anti-racism prescription. Absolutely fabulous. Um, Rawari, I've got a couple of questions here. I've got them for both of you. We're going to start with one that's aimed at you, Rawari. So this is from Miriama, and she says, Ngā mihi nui ki a kōrua e ngā rangatira. I relied on porting from you both for my thesis. Engari, she wanted to ask about the 2004 Special Rapporteur's report and Stephen Hagen identifying that racism in the media is a particular issue in Aotearoa. What traction or incentive is there to establish an independent monitoring commission? I'd like to put that to both of you. Who'd like to start? It's a tour kana. What? You're the tour kana. I love it. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, so actually, I really uh, like that idea. And we've been thinking about that because we have, uh, so the news media in Aotearoa are, um, watched over by the BSA, the uh, Broadcasting Standards Authority and the Media Council. Um, and uh, that's actually a really good solution. Thank you very much. Um, who suggest, uh, whoever suggested that, sorry, I've forgot, forgotten the name. Mediana. Um, because that is actually something I will put on my list now because I really like that idea and it hasn't happened. And why wouldn't we consider that is something for us to do either as part of the Media Council or the Broadcasting Standards Authority. Both of those organisations are at the moment, there's discussion around whether they need to be brought together because um, most media uh, organisations are now multimedia organisations where we're not just TV or we're not just radio or we're not just um, print so or digital now. So um, that is very excellent. I really love that idea. It's now on my list of things to do and take from this court at all. So thank you very much. Um, 
we, a, a couple of years ago, after we uh, did the apology, Māori um, journalists from across the industry, we finally got together. We used to um, collaborate and work together really closely at the beginning of the 2000s. Um, but then we just became disparate and we just got on with our work as you do, head down, bum up. Um, and trying to do the work you can within your own organisations. So we came back together again. Um, and so what that means is that we um, we are trying to rebuild and re-establish um, the work that we've done. And because of that, because of we've come together, um, not that it's just for us to hold the um, hold everyone to account, but it is really just to amplify our voices again and to really uh, take a strong stand. Um, and that is to also, um, we had a lot of influence over the public interest journalism funding rounds. Uh, and so we were able to talk to that. Um, and as part of that, um, um, Whareke from Massey University, we were able to um, create a report that they just put out this week. So I can um, send that uh, to uh, put that into um, our corridor today as well, the link to it so that you can see um, some of the suggestions that they made around what we could do to improve representation and deal with racism uh, in uh, the media sector. Uh, yep. I'll get that and send it to. Yeah, that's me. That's all I've got to say. Uh, hey, so, what traction or incentive is there, do you think, to establish some sort of monitoring commission? Yeah, I, th I think there's probably two, op it's a good idea, uh, there's probably two options in there. One is to have an independent standalone uh, body uh, that, that might deal with complaints around racism. Uh, the other one is to, inside those existing structures like uh, uh, the BSA, is to um, restructure that in, a, in terms of a mainstream and uh, say perhaps statility or or multicultural um, stream. Uh, one of the things I'm quite um, uh, keen on is um, uh, creating a kōrawai that marries uh, issues of racism against Māori um, in the media into, into, uh, alongside uh, racism against um, other ethnic groups like uh, the Chinese Asian community uh, the Indian community, you know, we saw New Zealand first have a good go at that just before the last uh, uh, election, and also the Islamic community. Uh, sometimes in these initiatives, uh, we have a bifurcation between uh, Māori as tangata whenua and kind of everyone else on the other side. But it's really important to remember that uh, racism against the Islamic community, Asian community, Indian subcontinent community, Pacific Island communities, it's really just another expression of the racism that we've always endured. And we've endured it for the longest and, um, and, and more intensely, particularly during the times and things like that. And we would be stronger if there was a coming together of those energies and understandings and going forward. It would also help break down the Pākehā monopoly over racism because they, uh, the Pākehā monopoly likes to deal with Māori racism over here, Pacifica there, Islamic community there. And it's kind of like uh, the unspoken is, is that they monitor um, all those groups. But um, in fact, uh, on people who are the main recipients of racism, the main victims of racism, we should actually um, come together and put things back from our point of views. So total talk with that, I remember that report and um, you know, hats off to any student that's, that's gone and dug that report out from 2004. It was like it was yesterday, but gosh, it's 18 years ago. Oh, well, you should get, a, you should get first class honours for that thesis, I would imagine. I'm sure that Miriam will be delighted to hear that. Um, thank you for your input, both of you. Um, Carmen, I've got a question for you relating to something you said earlier, but I'm going to just read out a comment from one of our um, our participants, Maria. She says, Kia ora kōma, a Carmen, not a pātai, more of a comment of Potoko. You are setting the pace, Carmen. It's like the long game. Transformation efforts demand pace, persistence and leadership. The changes you have made in media driving the way to transform how Māori kōrero is shared and shifts away from the constant colonial deficit rhetoric. Keep up the awesome mahi. That's from Maria. 
Now, I have a question for you. Um, obviously, you and I both come from newsrooms, and you were talking before about you know how newsrooms and journalists need to do better. And I was curious to find out what you thought doing better meant. So I suppose my question to you is, what is it that mainstream journalists don't understand that they need to understand to do a better job? First of all, I just wanted to say thank you, Maria. I really appreciate your kind words because uh, often I don't get a lot of kind words when it comes to trying to do this work. So it's really nice to um, hear some support where we can. And also to remind me, patience, is the, it is a long game, um, this work, sadly. Um, so one of the things that I've learned the most uh, in the last two years, uh, actually particularly uh, through Tamato Puno, which was the uh, project we did to not only look at um, how we had portrayed Māori at staff and through all of our newspapers, but also in part two of Tamato Puno, which was looking at the history of Aotearoa. And what what was the, the one thing that stood out for me was kuaretanga, so ignorance. And it was because all of us are ignorant of our history. We don't know uh, what we don't know. We therefore can't contextualise the issues of the day. So if you don't know your history, you don't understand why uh, we are, why there is a, a massive amount of focus and reporting on Māori communities, Pacific communities, and the pandemic. The context to it is because we have been dealt some serious uh, heavy blows by being in, uh, 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 suffering from institutional racism in the health system. And therefore, uh, that puts uh, not just that, but also poverty uh, and other issues uh, that have come because of colonisation and systemic, systemic racism in those systems. Um, because we don't, if we don't contextualise um, what, what's happening now, by knowing our history, it means when we do our news, we just do a straight off the bat without the context of that um, issue. Uh, and so that's the one thing that I've learned the most. And so I really, um, so one of the things we did do really well at stuff, I have to say, is that we backed a call a few years ago for history to become taught in schools. So that generation, generation alpha, who by all accounts are going to be quite a scary uh, group of young people, uh, Generation Alpha, they will get the benefits of knowing our history. They will be able to contextualise modern day issues around climate change, um, haora, uh, education, uh, the justice system, right? So, um, so when I talk about our journalists and um, it's, in, it's our academics, it's all people, we don't know our history, therefore we don't know what's we don't know how to contextualise what's happening now. So, um, so what we've been talking to our journalists about is to just really understand that it's not as simple as uh, Māori, uh, ma ma low vaccination rates amongst Māori. Oh, they're lagging. We, we could have been reporting like, oh, they're just lagging. Māori are lagging. Uh, Māori need to do better. Uh, when in fact, the kōrero was turned around to the government needs to do better. We, our, our district health boards need to do better. We are not focused enough on Māori to um, get them to equity to, uh, around vaccination, to help our journalists understand that the reasons for it is a lack of trust in the system, a lack of trust with authority, lack of trust with the government. So there's all these things that we've been trying to teach our journalists to understand and contextualise what's happening in the pandemic. And that's just one example of it. Um, and also when they go to when they go to um, the one o'clock stand-ups. In the past, when we go and we would talk to um, authority, we'd just lump everybody in together. And But what it meant was that was a very Eurocentric view, a very monocultural view on the issue. And therefore we were just getting the answers for monocultural New Zealand or Pakia New Zealand, rather than uh, different communities needed different solutions, but they equally need journalists to stand up for each and every single community that has not been that has been underrepresented in the past, and that's what we're trying to do in Potiaki. But gee, it, it's it's trying to teach individually journalists, individual journalists, to understand the history, and um, I think that's a big that's one of the big issues. Mm. 
Interesting. Um, Bowie, is there something you'd like to add to that? I, I agree with what um, uh, Carmen says uh, about understanding the, the history. I mean, uh, at the end of the day, we, we're not going to stand a chance of eradicating racism from our society unless we understand our history. And ultimately, the two biggest things we have to understand about our history is A, that our history is racist, and the kind of racism that we've experienced since contact, um, Western colonial racism, has been the most virulent form of racism to ever have existed on the face of the planet. That's, that's just the bottom line. The, second, the, the um, second other aspect of our history that we need to understand, and it is the fundamental tension between Rangatira Tanga and Kawana Tanga, is that the treaty never ceded um, um, sovereignty to, to the Crown. Uh, the two texts are not really translatable. Um, you know, there is all sorts of intellectually elastic sorts of exercise to try and make that fit. But the bottom line is, is they are quite different. Māori signed um, the one in Te Reo mainly, and all the discussions were held in that context. Um, the fact is, is at the end of the day, the biggest historical fact that we have to um, take on board is that the Crown didn't obtain sovereignty over the country in 1840. Rather, they acquired it over the following 60 years or so, uh, taking land, when Māori resisted taking land, then it was warfare, then it's unjust legislation, it's the abrogation of our fundamental human rights. So if necessary, people would be imprisoned without facing charges and for lengthy periods of time. Um, and we you know, had all this other violence alongside it. And when we get on top of those two things, then we're going to relax quite a bit more as a, as a nation, and that'll make a difference, not only in the media, but in all uh, uh, several other aspects of our society. The other ones uh, that are really important here, I mean, um, you know, as I referred to before, there's, there's an increasing number of really cool and uh, younger generation um, Māori journos out there, you know, I try and maintain relationships with them and, and also not only talk about the news, but, but also just how they're going into their, their writing life and reporting life because it's just, uh, it's just such a really great thing to witness. But over and above that, uh, the media is not going to change just because we have uh, more, uh, an increasing number of busy brown reporters. What it's going to take is a change of leadership. You know, and I really take my hat off to Carmen. You know, I know what it's like to confront racism in an institutional context. And that's really, really challenging every day. It goes right to your heart and soul. You're, you're, you're really vulnerable. And, you, you, you know, the only way you're going to survive that is, A, is if you're an alcoholic. And, two, if you've got some kind of strong wairua and inspiration and whānau support around you. Eh? And, and the second one's better than the first one. Um, and, you know, I just take my hats off to her. But at the end of the day, what we need to see in the media is particularly in our uh, major media organisations uh, like Staff, The Herald and so on and so forth, um, you know, in radio um, and television, is Māori leadership of mainstream news. Not just the kārere, not just the Māori news, but the editor. And one of you know, if I reflect back on, on what they would look like in a university, rather than the Māori lecturer always going to the pro vice chancellor or the executive committee or the vice chancellor and making really polite, you know, slightly firm suggestions and waiting for those to be accepted. Uh, when you're the CEO, you just write memos. We want things to be this way. Thank you, everybody. And, and it's yeah, that's the sort of future that we need to shape in our media. Uh, hoi anō, kia ora, kia ora great, that's great. Let's let's turn to some questions from our lovely audience. So here I have one from Tanaya, and she says, I'm a first year student at Massey University for a Bachelor of Social Work. I would just like to ask, if there is there anything a social worker can do in regards to the bias in the media against Māori specifically? I'm actually going to turn to you first, Rawiri, for this one, because of course, social work is a tertiary education, and you might have some ideas here about what social workers trained in universities might be able to do in regards to the bias against Māori in the media. 
Well, one of the things that uh, the social the discipline of social work can do was come up with uh, more programs for conducting welfare amongst the racist community to educate them out of the straitjacket of their assumptions and prejudices. Um, that's that's one of the key things. Uh, in in the current situation, obviously, in the front in terms of frontline social work. It's about understanding what's happening to the communities that you're dealing with, uh, Māori communities and so on and so forth. Um, many years ago, before I, I went to university, I was a detached, uh, detached youth worker through the Department of Internal Affairs. Uh, the detached youth work scheme was set up by Rob Muldoon in the wake of the 1978 Moriwa, what they called the Moriwa riot. And uh, so I, my job was frontline street work with uh, gang members, what they used to call in those days street kids. And um, the difference between what, what our team did and what ma mainstream social workers did is mainstream social workers had a deficit um, understanding of um, what they would call at-risk youth in those days, whereas we had a cultural insider, um, affine, uh, Ethic understanding of their situation and how how they how Maori came to be in that position, and that's you know really a big big the big challenge for uh, social work all work in and around youth suicide is to understand the history the colonial history and the racist history that's what that's got our people there. So just as a quick example, uh, 2018 OECD report had New Zealand. Um, with rank New Zealand with the highest rate of adolescent suicide in the OECD. Now, the reality of that is if you extracted the Maori statistics from the national statistics, the national statistics were only average in the OECD. It's the Maori statistic that was the worst in the OECD. And if you and it was because of our proportion of the population just pushes the push the uh, national figures you know to that far end. If you did the same with the Aboriginal community in Australia, so Australia ranks about middle in OECD for adolescent suicide, um, and that's because uh, the smaller percentage of the Aboriginal community in those figures, their their stats get smudged over by the national rate per population. But if you extract those, then it's the Aboriginal First Nations people who have the worst figures in the OECD, followed by New Zealand, then followed by uh, First Nations Canada, and so on and so forth. And social workers need to click on to those sorts of realities and why those realities exist, rather than the, you know, this person's got a mental problem. They haven't got a mental problem. Our society's got a racist problem. Gordon? Okay. Got a question for you, Carmen. I'm just thinking, looking at the time and thinking about turning the discourse towards what we know has worked. So just linking back to what you said, Carmen, you talked about that people are ignorant, they're kuare, and they don't know what they don't know, and they leap, they tend to leap for stereotypes and crass generalizations. So in terms of your work in the media, especially in the last two years, what I suppose success stories have you seen in terms of people's attitudes changing? Can you give me some idea of and what sort of processes have you seen people go through? Because for a lot of non-Māori, we know that they find it very confronting to confront their own racism. And I know because I spoke to one of your reporters before the apology that a lot of the reporters who are looking at the stories of the past were quite shocked by what they found and felt terrible about it. So can you give us some idea of what sort of positive steps do you have seen people take and what, how that's ended up, what the hua have been, the benefits? Yep, so um, just doing the investigation itself uh, and talking about it internally um, and then getting reporters to to be a part of Tamato Puno, one, and then two, um, has switched it up. So for an exa for example, a, a Pākehā journalist who uh, did sports forever um, through this lens and being part of this project, he... Um, changed his whole whole perspective and he's not the only one there are a lot of journalists that um, have said oh wow you can actually teach an old dog new tricks so 
that's been said a few times. Um, but I saw in the um, uh, the commentary threads um, today from our audience um, uh, decolonization training. So um, two things have happened in that space. So one, uh, we actually will be rolling out a program um, internally at staff to do that for all of our journalists because they actually want to know they they want to try and do better as well so they um so a, a, a reporter recently said Carmen I'm having um troubles with not trouble but I'm trying to engage with iwi uh, and struggling to do that I says okay well it's going to take you uh 27 years uh because that's how long it takes to build a relationship with iwi but uh just uh, kidding aside so um but to understand why he wasn't able to do that and actually understand their history on the issue that he's dealing with so by understanding their history of the issue and he actually started to change the way he was looking at the story and realize again this is about contextualizing why certain things are being done so um, we will be rolling out training internally. That training will then become available uh, for other organisations as well as journalism schools. Um, the other part is um, there is training being undertaken. So that Fariki report that we've put up there, that is also uh, being made available to all media organisations to get funding through the New Zealand Audio, um, uh, Public Interest Journalism Funding. There actually has you actually have to have um, a Māori organisa, uh, media um, uh, company come in and support their work in that space as well. So there is actually a lot of education and development going on internally. We don't, and, and you can actually just physically see the, the shifts going on everywhere. It's going to take time. We're going to keep um, fucking it up, like stuffing it up, sorry, um, stuffing it up, right? So, I, I make mistakes. Um, we make mistakes at stuff, and you know we try to apologise for it as soon as we can, if we, um, when we can. Um, uh, but I think that that is why you know there's just so many little shifts, so many big shifts going on, and I don't think people really fully understand that that is happening. Um, it should have happened a long time ago, uh, but sometimes things just it's all about timing. Uh, when the stars, moons, planets, when the maramataka aligns, then we're we're good to go. So there is a lot of good stuff happening, but it is it is taking time. Thank you, Carmen. But I would ease. So, in your experience working in this anti-racism space, what sort of positive shifts have you seen on a societal or a, an individual level as people come to terms with their own racism or their own thoughtlessness, perhaps? Well, I could just say at a personal level, you know, obviously what stuff has done is, is landmark. It's put a it's put a line in the sand, and um, it's really awesome to see uh, the recruitment of um, young Maori reporters. You know, uh, more broadly across mainstream has been really great. But uh, I also have some relationships with uh, different reporters um, who are Pakia and who are much better than the Pakia reporters you used to get twenty years ago. You know, uh, generally a little bit younger, but really talented, skillful writers and reporters, but also have a much broader understanding of, of uh, the racism that abounds. So that's really encouraging. A couple of things, other things I think going forward, obviously, you know, I'd like to see more Māori CEOs. So send the whole crew an, an email saying, please take Friday off and have a special long weekend. Come back on Monday, decolonise. Thank you. <laughs> but... Some more practical things that we can do, you know, like during COVID, we've seen different media outlets produce fact checking stuff. A really good initiative in the media would be stuff material that fact checked racism in the history of our country. And it would be more powerful if that was formed in terms of a partnership between journalists, um, but also people that um, are part of civil society and at the front line of those kind of things in the community. You know, one of the problems with the misinformation, uh, the counter misinformation effort is that, um, you know, staff's had its fact checking, I think, Radio New Zealand, but it's kind of isolated from civil society. So it's not really gained enough traction and we're not being nowhere near as broadly organised as the COVID misinformation spreaders. But something around racism and via a partnership, that would be really awesome to see. Thank you. 
Uh, kia ora mai tata. One thing we haven't really talked about, and I and I apologise, we should have maybe have talked about this earlier, was um, with me, with the media. Um, we actually we we do we, you know we have to abide by a set of rules regulations, um, and we um, and we have to stick with that right, and we're trying to improve that space. But what we haven't talked about is the uh, is social media and the massive impact that has had on um, racism as well. Um, and that has amplified the racism towards Rawiri, to a lot of our journalists as well, to myself. Um, and that, that, that racism as well as, um, and the prejudice. Uh, so in our Potiaki team, we've got two wonderful reporters who are both, who are both have disabilities. Um, and, you know, we received an email from someone who uh, was just nasty about uh, raising up the issues of disability. So, the, and and we've got a lot of that stuff around in our social media. We, that, there's no no one. There's no checks and balances in there. There's nothing to um, stop the uh, racism and hate that comes out towards our uh, Muslim community, towards our Maori community, our Wahine Maori, who um, have been really vilified and Rawiri as well. So. Um, so that is a really big issue. Mm -hmm. There is no one, uh, there's no checks and balances on social media and, and that's really where we really need to focus, which is what Rawiri was talking about, where we've actually started to fact check a lot of the stuff, misinformation coming out uh, of social media. Disinformation is the biggest one. Um, I knew the world had lost the plot when we had uh, anti-mandate protesters calling uh, Tami Iti a kūpapa. When that happened, I knew we've lost the fucking plot. I'm sorry, we've <laughs> lost the plot now when this is the type of corridor and rhetoric bollocks that's coming out of social media. So that is really, that to me is very, very harmful. We've got more controls around uh, media, uh, Māori television, radio, all that, but way more there, but we don't have around mm. social media. And that is a corridor we really need to get onto yeah. really quickly because that is... Well, like we, the, the media compared to all the voices and stuff and information coming out of social media, we're at this much compared to that much. And that's very troubling. Yeah. We, we, we just, we are struggling in the media to control that the rubbish that is coming out of uh, social media. Kia ora, Carmen. Yes, we could spend hours and hours and hours and hours talking about social media. It is a problem. Uh, tēnā tātou, everyone. I wish we could keep going with this fascinating conversation, but we do have a time limit here. Um, and we do need to wrap up, unfortunately. Look, I'm sorry that we didn't get through everyone's questions, but thank you, every everyone, our, uh, everybody out there for engaging. Um, I would like to especially thank our two manuwhiri, Carmen and Rawiri, and all of you out there in cyberspace for your interest in this session and your engagement. It's been lovely. Now, I'd just like to acknowledge the many sponsors who've made this event possible. Um, and I would like once again to acknowledge Jared and Charles for their sterling work behind the scenes. Now, a recording of this session will be available via YouTube and Facebook under the title Totality Based Futures. Now, I'd just like to draw your attention to the Marathon for Social Justice, Kate Muru o Te Ahi, that means in the heat of battle. So in partnership with Pecha Kucha, which some of you probably know about, the final day of Totality Based Futures and anti-racism will be a platform for emerging voices. So we're going to have an epic 12 hour marathon of short interactive talks from students and recent graduates who will be pushing the boundaries in anti-racism here and internationally. So if you want to have your mind stimulated and possibly blown, I would um, recommend that to you. Um, so now what I'd like us to do is I'm just going to do a closing cut of here to release ourselves from this co-papa. And um, once again, thank you very much everyone for coming. It's been a really stimulating hour and I hope you go on to enjoy many more sessions in this, this, this conference. Unuhia, unuhia tūra te pū take o ngā kororo te wānanga. Unuhia te hau tapu o ngā reke, whake iri e rongo ki a paitara whare. Unuhia, 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 te uru tapu nui a tāne ki a wāta, ki a māma, te ngā koe te tēnana, te wairu, te hiningaru i te ara takatū. Koe rā e rongo whakaria ki runga rā, ki a wātea, ki a wātea, aira, kua wātea, Oh. Tena tato katoa.